This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for Flames fans in Calgary and southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. This is Dan and Matt back once again to talk Flames hockey, and it's been quite an interesting week for the Flames. Um, Matt, why don't we jump right into this? Four games. We'll talk about the Vegas game from last week, but I think overall a really good week for the Calgary Flames. I agree, and it was nice to see Mike Smith get a game and play well, and hopefully he can parlay that into continued good play. Last week we recorded during the uh, Vegas visit to Calgary, and why don't we start by talking about that. The Calgary Flames last week won 7-2 to two over the Golden Knights. Goudreau and Kachuk each recorded four points, while Monaghan added two goals in, I think we've used the, um, I, I think we've used the term a few times, usually we're on the other end, but this was, this was a blowout. Oh yeah. Well, Reminds me of the Pittsburgh when- game, but for the guys in red. Yeah, well, when you have seven goals in the first 25 minutes, you, uh, the game's over. And, yeah, they, the Flames just took their foot off the gas after that point because, really, they're dead. You don't need to beat the dead horse. Uh, TJ Brody got his first goal of the game, or first goal of the year, I should say, on this one, which is good. Um so nice to see him finally on the board. And obviously goals from Kachuk, Goudreau, Monaghan, Brody, Monaghan, Kachuk, Bennett. Quite a few Flames goals here. We also saw here, and we'll talk about it later, Bennett playing on the second line, which will be a continued theme throughout the week. Yeah, th- that game was like a, you get a goal, and you get a goal, and everybody gets a goal. It's like Oprah's favorite things for goals. Exactly. It they, was a good game. <laughs> nice thing you know, they could just call one lucky fan down to the ice to get his goal. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I felt bad for Subban in that one. Well, frankly, it wasn't even his fault. Like, the first five goals in the first period, he had no chance on any of them. And when your team is playing as badly as Vegas was in that game, like, that was... One team showed up, and the other team... it. Frankly, the Knights looked like the Calgary Hitmen if the Hitmen were having a bad game. So, there was no defense. <laughs> nope. And it's not surprising that any NHL team, if they're playing even remotely well against a team that was having that bad of a game, would put up that kind of a score. Well, the next game was the uh, Winnipeg Jets coming to the Dome to visit the Flames. And we this was one I think you and I were both tossing around of not really sure what to expect. Winnipeg's been expected to be quite a good team this year. And Calgary once again spanked a team, uh, winning 6-3 over the Jets. The Flames scored five goals in the first period for the second straight game, and Riddick was in net and made 37 saves in this one. We saw, finally, Dylan Dubé break his goal streak in the NHL, getting his first goal. That was his first NHL goal, not just this year, but ever. And that was the first goal of the game to open scoring. We saw Bennett back on the board, Kachuk, Jankowski, and Goudreau. So... I think in this one, Jankowski, Dubé, Bennett, good to see those guys getting back on the board. Well, frankly, the Flames, if they're going to have any lasting success, you cannot just rely on the Goudreau and Kachuk lines to drive your entire offense. You need guys on the third and fourth line chipping in here and there. You don't need them scoring consistently every game, but the odd goal here and there will help. Oh, and then I forgot there's a Derek Ryan goal here as well. Any overall thoughts on this one besides the goals? Well, it was neat to see the Flames uh, score back-to-back five goal in the first period games, which was the first time since 1989 when the St. Louis Blues did it, and only the Detroit Red Wings and Edmonton Oilers had ever had a a pair of games like that. So, I, I remember a few years ago, you and I sitting here talking about one goal games. I mean... Do you remember those seasons of wow we won one nothing or three to two? Like we're not used to seeing the Flames dominate a period this this quickly in a game and much less this handedly. 
Well, and that's one of those things. Like, the Flames, pretty much since the early 90s, have been an also-ran kind of a team. And, like, even when the Flames did make the playoffs in the early 90s and in the mid-2000s, they were never really one of the favorites, and they never really had a ton of offensive depth. Like, the 4 Cup run, like, it was basically Jerome Ginla and Mika Kiprasov, and that was basically the whole team in terms of, like, dynamite offensive talent, and... We're seeing a Flames team now where they have four guys that are in the top 15 in scoring. Giordano's one of the top scoring defensemen. Like, the, the amount of depth and talent that this team has is pretty much... You have to go right back to 1990 for the Flames to have this kind of offensive talent in their lineup throughout. So the fact that they can get all up on teams like Vegas and Winnipeg and throw, you know, like those are the two defending Western Conference finalists. And they threw 10 goals in the first period at them. So like, it's not like they're bad teams. They just, they managed to get all over them. And that's not something that we're used to for sure. It's interesting too. If you look back at even last month, the start of the season, this team was waiting until the third period to do anything. I mean, how often would we get down three, four goals in the first? And it's like, yeah, okay, it's the last 20. We better come out and do something. And now the guys seem to want to do it the other way. You know what? Let's get this over early with, or let's get this. Oh yeah. Let's get this over with early. It's like, Hey, you mean that the first 40 minutes count? Oh, okay. <laughs> Let, let's just get up early, and then we can relax for the rest of the night, hang out, whatever. Yeah. Well, like, especially in that Winnipeg game, in the second and third period, the Flames played poorly, and they nearly let Winnipeg... Like, they didn't expect them to come back. Like, Vegas, they kind of rolled over and died when it was 7 nothing, And Winnipeg actually fought back, and... I think that kind of caught them off guard a bit, and it nearly was 5-4 at one point, like if it, not for a disallowed goal. So. Well, and I think that's another great thing about what you're talking about with the depth of this team. I mean, we're seeing that other teams are mounting an offense, and the Flames are still able to go in there, play a more defensive game, and keep, you know keep the puck out of their own net. So they're, we're able to see the transition in that game based on what needs to be done. It's not just, you know, as we've seen with some high-scoring teams, of our goal is to put the puck in their net more than they put it in our net. Yeah, sort of like the Ottawa Senators right now. Where or, I mean, that's each, Edmonton's strategy. Yeah, where each game 6-4 and, you know, whoever's on what side of it, it's not very good hockey. After those two home games, the Flames went on the road. They went to Vegas after having Vegas annihilated here at the Dome, and the Flames didn't get much in their Black Friday game. No deal for them as Vegas shut them out 2-0. Um, I think in this one, the story is Marc-Andre Fleury. Frankly, this is a game where if you said the score was 2 nothing Calgary, it would have made sense. And either way, they, it was a very tight game, and the bounces went Vegas' way. This could have easily been a 0-0 game heading into overtime. It, each of the goalies played well. Flurry was better, and the Flames were just frustrated, and they didn't get anything going. Yeah, I think that, it, you know, after... I, I got the sense in the first period of this one that the Flames maybe came in not playing as hard as they needed to. I think maybe they were remembering the Vegas they just annihilated earlier in the week. And I think they really let Vegas maybe get into their own zone more than they should have. Yeah, I can and agree with that. good shooting lanes more than they should have. I mean, Vegas didn't score till the second, but I feel like Vegas maybe came out and put more pressure on the Flames than they expected. Yeah, I agree. And it made sense that Vegas, after getting humiliated like that, would be, yeah, you're not doing that to us again. So no Black Friday deal for the Flames. Uh, Sunday, they went to the desert to take on the, and it's still weird for me to say this, the Arizona Coyotes. And once again, the Flames said, you know what? We can't take a 2 nothing loss. we got to blow somebody out. So 6-1 to one against Arizona. And this is a game that had a few milestones in it. Mark Giordano hit his 400th NHL point um, in this game. And also James Neal got his 500th NHL point. So some veterans... 
getting some milestones in this one, which is always good to see, but I think we probably all could have anticipated a blowout here. Well, the fact the Flames had uh, three shorthanded goals was a bit weird as well, because it's the first time since 1997 that the Flames have had three shorthanded goals in a game. And it was nice to see that different players were contributing. It wasn't just Gaudreau, Monaghan, Kachuk, like it has been for most of the year. Instead, you got two goals from Jankowski, Noah Hannafin got his first two goals as a Flame, and TJ Brody got his second. Yeah, like you said earlier, I think that's probably the one of the storylines of this past week is mixing up that scoring and getting everyone involved. You know, we saw some firsts in a lot of these games. Uh, it was good to see Neil back on the board. He's not getting as many points as we wanted him to get. Um, but Janko getting up there, Hannafin getting up there, we're spreading that scoring out, and that's what makes us more dangerous. Yeah, and that Jankowski shorthanded goal in the third period, what an individual effort there. One on four, and he takes the puck behind the net and then still fights, digs the puck out and breaks out front and scores. Like, it's, that it's, was pathetic. <laughs> it's when I see efforts like that. I mean, you and I have been a bit critical of Janko this year. And when I see stuff like that, it's like, you know what? Maybe there's still some some juice left in this kid. Maybe there's still some, um, you know, something left here that we don't see. Well, I think, frankly, for the first month of the season, he just had not adapted to the NHL adapting to how he played and he had to change up his game a little bit to be a little more assertive and he's been coming on lately i th i think that was his third goal th this week and he, he played well and if he can continue to chip in every once in a while like i'm not expecting him to get 17 or 18 goals or what he had last year but if he can chip in 12 15 like, that would be excellent, and frankly, the Flames need that from him in the third and fourth line role. And it's interesting, because you and I, I think going into the season had pegged sort of pairs for that, you know, forward group, and one of the pairs that we pegged that we thought worked well last year was Sam Bennett and Mark Jankowski, and now we separate them, and both guys seem to be doing well. The Flames shook up their top six. Goudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm are still together, but that second line has become Kachuk, Backlund, and Bennett on the right. An interesting pairing, which puts Zarnik, Ryan, and Neil as the third line, and then Dubé, Jankowski, Hathaway on the fourth. Uh, Matt, let's look at the two opposite sides of this. What do you think of Bennett on the second line? Uh, he has played well all season. And, like, even though he had very few points, he was doing everything that he needed to do in order to be successful. And when you're getting that many high-quality chances, eventually they will start going in. And he was rewarded with more ice time and better line mates. And since he's been on that second line, he's been one of the Flames' best forwards, as he has been all the season, but even more so. And he's starting to chip in a little bit, and that's... He still has the potential to be a 25, 30 goal scorer. Like, it, the, that potential never disappeared. He just, it took him a while to figure out how to be successful at the NHL level. And sometimes players take a while. And I think line mates have been a part of it too, seeing him with two high quality guys. True. Like, when you're playing with Troy Brower, uh, I don't care really who you are, you're going to have a little bit of trouble with offense. So, you know, the fact that now he's on a line with two guys who are very good at playing with the puck, it allows him to do the things that he needs to be successful with, and he's looked well thus far, and frankly, I'd leave that line alone until it needs to be switched up. We know that Kachuk can be a bit of a crap disturber for the Flames. He's our yeah. goody sandpaper guy, and we've seen that from Bennett this season, which has really surprised me because that's not normally his game. So I really like that line. You've kind of got both wings as your sandpaper guys, which lets Backlund do his thing. It's well, the, it's the thing is that, chemistry. that uh, Bennett, like all through his junior career and even early in his career, was thought of as being that rugged physical guy who could chip in some offense. But he hasn't really been able to utilize that asset. And, like, when you talk to Flames players, like, they'd frequently say that Bennett's the best hitter on the team and would deliver the hardest 
body checks and now we're actually seeing that in-game action where like he nailed Darnell Nurse the other day and sent him flying and that's one of those things that I think under the previous coach all of the players were not allowed to play a physical game much to their detriment I think and now we're starting to see guys like Hathaway like Bennett like Kachuk play the way that they are accustomed to and they're having success in doing so i saw that nurse hit from the press box it was amazing to watch especially when you looked at the number on the back of who delivered it you're like whoa that came from bennett yeah well that's the thing like even in juniors he was known for throwing hits like that where it was just like a freight train going over whomever he decided to hit and he can do that at the NHL level. It's just that under Gullitz and he didn't really like anybody hitting, so nobody could see that from him. And now he's using that tool and it's paying off. On paper, I like that line with Bennett on it better than Froelich. I I do too. Because Froelich is a... He's one of those, like jack-of-all-trade guy where he's good at everything but not exceptional and you can because he's good at everything you can stick him on any of your four lines and he'd be okay and i i think that bennett is more in need of playing up in the lineup where for leak if he's playing on the third or fourth line He's still going to do everything that Fro Leak does. And Fro has that consistency that when we get an injury, we've been pretty good so far, knock on wood. Um, we can put Fro up there if we need to for a week, two weeks, and he's fine. Exactly. And you can slot him pretty much anywhere in the lineup, and he'll play his game, and he'll be effective. Well, let's look at the other side of that pairing we talked about breaking up, and you talked a little bit about a Janko has been moved to the center position on the fourth line with Dubé and Hathaway. I would say that I really like the makeup of that line too. I think Dubé and Jankowski we've seen some good stuff from. And again, throwing that sandpaper piece in there with Hathaway, he's sort of, I noticed this week he was making room, especially for Janko to do his thing, which I think is what Janko needs. He's not a big guy, and I think part of where he's struggled this year is is being pushed around a little bit by bigger guys. So I think having Hathaway to make that room for him in the offensive zone has helped Janko out. Well, if you look back a couple of years ago, the Flames farm team's top line was Manjapane, Jankowski, and Hathaway. And Dubé and Manjapane are more or less the same type of player, speedy, skilled guy that's a little undersized. And... With that line, what made that line successful in Stockton was the fact that Dubé was the disturber who would go in on the forecheck and throw the defenders off their game because, they, you know, you'd have Hathaway flying at them, and it would create space for the other two guys to do their thing. And Hathaway has very good instincts. Like, we saw that on uh, the Hannafin goal that deflected in that was a pass towards Hathaway in front of the net. Like, he's very good at being in the right spots, even though Hathaway offensively isn't the most talented of players. And both the other guys help to feed off of that. And having the three together, I think, works better than the sum of their parts, because Hathaway in and of himself is just your prototypical Just like the 3M line did, right? It was... It was better as a group than they were individually. Yeah, because Hathaway is more or less your generic 12th, 13th forward, but he has that good chemistry with Jankowski and did back when they were in line mates in Stockton. And you're seeing that now where each of them is creating space for each other. And now, like, that line's actually becoming an offensive threat in where before it was like, oh, the force line's out, how fast can we get Goudreau back out there, Kachuk back out there? Well, and it's nice because we do have that defensive shutdown forward almost on every line except the first, so it's not like you need to say, okay, fourth line goes out against the first to shut them down. I mean, traditionally that was our second line, so it really lets the coach, I think, roll lines better when there's a little bit of offense and a little bit of defense and a little bit of grit on every line. 
Yeah, I agree. And that it just helps to make everybody a little better when you have that good working relationship amongst all of the players. And, like, we're seeing that on each of the lines where... Not necessarily the third line, because I think that Zarnik has been just kind of a little iffy, but... Like, when Froelich gets back from his injury, I think he'll take Zarnik's spot on the third line, and even though it'll be on the left side, and, you know, I think that would work a little better, but we're starting to see that three-man unit instead of just pairs. Well, if we take a look at the standings right now, this puts Calgary first in the Pacific, something that we aren't that used to, is Calgary being number one with 14 points, San Jose's number two with 12 right below them, and in the conference, Calgary sitting fourth. Surprisingly, Colorado above them, um... With, uh, sorry, Calgary has 29 points, Colorado has 30 points, San Jose has 28 points. Um, Winnipeg's right there, Minnesota's right there. There's a lot of teams within two, three points of each other, but Calgary's currently fourth in the West with 29 points. Matt, last year at American Thanksgiving, which is really one of those milestones that analysts look at, the Flames were in a playoff spot as well, and as we know, didn't make the playoffs. The wheels came off late last season, but what do you think, looking at where we are now, arguably a better place and a better team, what do we have to do to make sure that the Flames don't fall out of contention again? Uh, well, uh, unless the Flames get hit hard by the injury bug, I don't, especially with how bad the Pacific Division is, I don't see them missing the playoffs. We have such a deep forward group, especially, you'd really have to be hit hard yeah, like, it, it, you'd basically have to lose all three of Kachuk, Gaudreau, and Monaghan, and then probably a couple other guys as well to have, uh, like, a complete disaster, <laughs> basically, to the team in order to miss the playoffs. And I don't see... Because you look at the other teams in the Pacific Division, the other than San Jose, who has a plus one in their goal differential... Uh, they everybody else is negative in their goal differential and i think calgary is plus 19 and that's more the indication of the quality of the team and you look at all the other teams in our division they're all frankly terrible and they don't really like they're not really in a position where like oh this player or that player was either hurt or is struggling but he'll bounce back like, each of those teams is basically what you see is what you get. And they're all, frankly, bad. And so the Flames, just by default, them and the Sharks, should make the playoffs just because there are teams that actually have players that can play hockey. One thing I think the Flames are doing really well is putting up points early. I mean, if we get an injury like the Smith injury or something like that late that's going to almost derail this team it gives the boys that ability to lose a couple or go on that losing streak. I mean, you and I have sat here in the past talking about crap. If we lose one more on this, you know, losing skid, we're done. So the fact they're putting up some points early, it gives them a little bit of a cushion, which I think knowing how the flames usually end their seasons, they're going to need later on. Yeah. And you also have to look at it. Like things have gone significantly wrong at times with this team where they've lost a lot of games where they should have won. And, you know, a lot of that had to do with Mike Smith being somewhat terrible, or, you know, frankly, a disaster at times. And the Flames could easily have six, eight more points than they do right now. And, like, we're in a similar position relative to where we were last year, but we're... Last year, we were a team that was kind of mediocre. Like, at this point, they had they were 20th in the NHL in goals and goals against. And yet, we're, we're basically at the same place we are now. This year, the Flames are 6th in goals for and 19th in goals against. So, we're kind of unlucky to be at this spot in the standings right now. Where last year, I think we were on the opposite end where we were over our heads and last year it evened out and I think this year especially with Riddick playing well 
and Smith did play very well in the Arizona game, that if he can turn it around, then the Flames should roll for basically the rest of the season and be one of the elite teams. I think that's a good point. Last year they were playing probably punching above their weight class, as people say. This year they're built to be a good team, and they're proving that they are that good team the way they're built. Transactions. The Flames finally made some transactions. It's one of those things, I don't know, this team has been oddly stable, if that makes sense. Like, most teams are seeing a transaction here, a transaction there. The only thing this team's really done is Peluso up, Peluso down. And so this week we had a whole bunch of transactions. Uh, Dalton Prout sent to the HL on a conditioning assignment. Matt, you and I both thought he'd probably get sent down, but we were thinking for good, not on a conditioning assignment. When was the last time we even saw him in a game? Has he played in an NHL game? Uh, I think it was the second game of the season against Vancouver. So he probably needs some conditioning. Yeah. I w- uh, th- that doesn't hurt. And I wouldn't be surprised if he looks good if they just keep him down there. Like, just wave him and keep him down there. Um, there's really no need for him right now. At the Later in the week, Froelich was put on the IR day-to-day with a lower body injury. And it's kind of weird to think. We were talking about him earlier. You really haven't noticed Michael Froelich out of the lineup. Like, for a guy who's been a second-line winger for this team, they've been able to fill spots well without him. And I think that shows just how deep the forward group is. Yeah, typically an injury to a guy like Froelich would be felt by the team. And... The Flames just thankfully have enough players where they can just keep rolling. Might be a bit of a worry for Fro. Crap, they didn't miss me that much. Well, and that's one of those things moving forward that a guy like Froelich might be a valuable trade chip in a possible deal if the Flames needed something else. But I honestly think Fro is a guy that you might dangle in a waiver, uh, or not a waiver, an expansion draft, and get claimed. Possibly. Depending on which year it is and who's available. Yeah, exactly. Like, I think the Flames might end up getting hit on the defensive side of things, just depending on... uh, Because I think you can only protect three and ten forwards, or eight and four, but... uh, Yeah, well, if they use the same rules, and it would depend how you go. You can either do, I think, uh, was it seven, three, and one, or ten total. Yeah, that was it. Um, the other one, and the one that worried me, Michael Stone on the IR. When I first read this, I thought, a press box injury? Did he get a popcorn kernel stuck in his teeth? Because, you know, I'm up there, and I don't want that to happen. But I guess it's blood clots, so I'm going to have to wear my compression socks so I don't get blood clots in the press box. Uh, Stoner out, and in place of Stoner and Froelich, Shillington and Lomberg recalled from Stockton. I know you've been a Lomberg fan. Not surprised with Shillington. We talked about him last week, one of the better players down there. I'm kind of surprised about Lomberg. It seems like they're just randomly cycling in hitter guys, whether it's Peluso or Lomberg. Um, I guess, I don't know, I was kind of expecting it to be one of their, if the guy's going to sit, I was expecting it to be one of their, like, Gray Ovax or uh, Buddy Robinson, one of these kind of older guys who doesn't need the play time. Well, it's also a reward for Lomberg because he's been a very good player for Stockton, and he does everything that the coaches ask of him. And, you know, you reward the guy. He does everything you want in his job, which is to be that physical fourth-line agitator, even though he's like five foot six or something like that. He still it gets under people's skin, and that's what you want from that sure type of player. Sort of reminds you of Theo Fleury that way, doesn't he? Yeah. That same generic thing, yeah. And plus he has good hair, and, you know, that's always good to see. That's the most important part to you? Yeah, you got to have that flow, man. Um, speaking of Stockton, they played a couple of games since we broadcast last. Last Tuesday, the 20th, an 8-2 to two win over the Tucson Roadrunners. Uh, the 21st, the next day, they lost 3-2 to two against the Roadrunners. And on Friday, the 23rd, uh, this past Friday, they ended up winning 6-5 to five against the San Diego Gulls. So some, some good games there um, uh, where it's, again, weird to see Schneider taking the the net there but he's looking good yeah well that's the thing like what i was mentioning last week with schneider is that like nobody expected riddick to be good at all frankly when we signed him 
and he just kept putting up good numbers and played decently at the AHL level, and that eventually forced the team's hand to give him a shot at the NHL level. I feel like, though, we'd seen Riddick play against men in Europe, so we sort of knew what we were going to get. Yeah, but Schneider's just a kid still, and I think he's 21 now, and you don't know. Sometimes goalies come out of nowhere. Like, Martin Jones, he was not... He wasn't even drafted, and he was just a training camp invitee, much in the same manner that Schneider was, and he turned into being one of the better starters in the NHL. So it, it can happen, and you just have to wait, see if he keeps playing well, give him more ice time, wait, see, and then give him more if he keeps it up. Talking about McDonald, um, you know, the other Kansas City goalie who was there with Schneider to start the season. He's actually looking pretty good right now in ECHL Kansas City. He's 7-1-0 and with a 2.33 GAA. Not bad for that league. And a .91 save percentage. So saving 91% of the shots put his way. And again, Mason McDonald, I wouldn't rule him out entirely either. I think and this is it, probably his last contract with this organization. It, and that very well could be, but goalies, until they hit 25, 26. I feel you know, like, though, I, even a goalie like that, it's not like he's a high commodity. You let him go for a couple of years. If he looks good, you can always bring him back. Yeah. Well, frankly, because of the fact the Flames don't have any goalies coming up through the pipeline, I wouldn't even be opposed to bring like, all four of our current farm team goalies back just to for like another year or two just because of the fact that who else are you going to put out on there like who's going to be the echl backup like well, does there's, it really there's matter that kid you and i saw at the uh at the rookie camp that college kid who i think they really like and i can see him replacing mcdonald this year yeah but i think 31 teams are going to be after him so yeah you know, it's one of those where if the flames can sign him then that changes the whole thing, and that'll come first anyway before any of those four guys come up. So it, it's one of those that, frankly, for like another year or two, it, if the they don't add somebody like that NCAA goalie, that you might as well just run with what you got and draft a couple more guys and see like how... The, the four do over like the next year or two then pare it down as the new guys come through the organization and start needing spots i have my prospect uh, media guide here that was matt galata yeah uh, number 31 I, I knew his name was matt just because you know obvious reasons well but. i was just looking here is either him or justin fazio and it wasn't fazio so by prospect no. of elimination those are the two goalies not signed yeah um Speaking of some prospects, should we do a bit of an update on where some of the Flames prospects are at? Sure. Milos Roman, playing for the Vancouver Giants, has got uh, 12 goals and 11 assists, 23 total points in 24 games so far. Adam Ruzhishka in the OHL, playing for Sarnia Sting, 7 goals, 18 assists, 25 points in 25 games. I love to see guys a junior who are getting point per game or really close to that. I think that's – I don't want to say it means they're going to be a good – pro guy but i think it's a good sign that you know these guys can are pretty natural of putting up points well that's like i always have like barometers with prospects and like frankly if they're to have any shot they need to be over that point per game or in that ballpark in order to even be thought of as being somebody who could potentially be a top six forward or have any frankly nhl potential and like it doesn't necessarily mean that'll translate like we've had guys like say carter banks who was great in juniors and then we Mat out. even matthew phillips has struggled to adjust to the hl yeah and that'll happen and but you just have to keep getting players like that because for every say five that struggle you might get a johnny goudreau and that makes all the difference in the world. Going to the QMJHL, the Flames prospect who I think still has the best name, D'Artagnan Jolie, 11 goals, 11 assists, 22 points in 26 games for Bay Como. 
Um, the hardest name on this list for me, Dmitry Zavgar- Zavgarodny, the, what was he, seventh round this past draft? Yes. 14 goals, 19 assists for 33 points in 26 games. He also played for Russia in the Canada-Russia Super Series where he got two goals and three points in two games. This guy's lighting up the QMJHL for Ramuski and surprise for a guy who was drafted as low as he was. Well, he was really good in that Holinchka tournament the year prior. And, like, everybody was thinking, oh, this guy might be a first-round pick. And then he played like crap the rest of the year. And everybody's like, well, he did play well that one tournament, but the rest of his season was horrible. Is there anything actually there, or did he just have a a solid one tournament and that was it? And thus far, it was showing that he just struggled adapting to the game and what you saw in that tournament was more of what he is and i think that he might end up being an nhl player down the road just because of the fact that there is a lot of skill there it's just for whatever reason he had a really bad year last year it's nice when you can sort of you know buy low on a guy like that um you know seventh round pick and he's looking really good again we'll see how that translates when he gets older but tearing up the QMJHL, which is a very competitive junior league, uh, getting 33 points in 26 games. And if you watch his goals on YouTube, they're nice goals too. Yeah, and that's what leads me to believe that there might be more there. And like the Flames might have actually fluked out and got a good one, much in the same way that they did with Manjapane. Like he w- had like zero points practically in the year prior to his draft year. Then in his draft year, he randomly put up over 100 points, and the team said to him, do that again and we'll draft you the following year. He did, so the Flames picked him in the sixth round, and he's become an NHL player, even just for a little while, and is now one of the top players in Stockton. Maybe that's going to be the same kind of a story, where they found a guy who randomly had a good stretch, and it might translate. Well, I mean, even just look at our current roster, right? I mean, Goudreau drafted in the fourth round, our captain not even drafted. Like, there's a lot of guys that go lower than they should be or don't even get drafted that do pretty TJ well. Brody, he was a fourth-round pick. Yeah, that's true. Wow, that's weird to think that half of our first pairing, one's a fourth-rounder and one wasn't even drafted. Yeah, and it, that's the way it goes sometimes. Like, you that's why i've always advocated especially after the first two rounds is go for skill just because you never know if it'll turn out and like if they can figure out the other parts of the game you get a high quality player for basically throw in draft picks like we saw uh, chris weidman get traded to edmonton this week for a six round pick and he's a seventh defenseman and like if you can translate a pick like that into somebody with actual value like that's a home run and calgary need especially with them using so many picks in trades to get guys like smith and hamannick if they can basically get found money by having some of these later round picks translate into actual nhl talent then it takes a lot of the pressure off of not having a first or second round pick last year For sure. And I mean, we even saw that the year we traded for Dougie and we ended up getting Shillington and Anderson in this, in our next two picks guys, I think are going to be very valuable for this organization. And now it turned out we ended up drafting the take, getting the guy who went fifth overall that year. So we traded a 15th overall pick and two seconds for the fifth overall pick. If you're looking on the roundabout kind of way. That's true. Yeah, it's true. Let's finish up the list here. Um, in the USHL, which is pretty much the, I don't know, the Canadian Junior League for the U.S., it's their top junior league, Martin Pospisil, centerman for Sioux City Musketeers, 10 goals, 21 assists for 31 total points in 17 games. Not as much competition as the Canadian juniors, but still pretty good. And then You in- know, really, they should trade D'Artagnan Jolie to that team just because Jol- D'Artagnan playing for the Musketeers. 
I don't think you can trade across borders like that with different leagues. But I know, but the name works. Well, now we got a name for his line when he turns pro. He can be the Three Musketeers line. Yeah. Um, and then we got some NCAA guys. The Flames, as we know, have been looking more at the NCAA for drafting since the Feaster era. Uh, Demetrius Kumansis, who's a left winger for Arizona State, has seven points in 16 games. Matthias, Matthias Emilio Pedersen, uh, centerman for Denver, 14 points in 12 games. And Mitch Matson, name we haven't talked about in a while, has zero points in five games. So that wraps up pretty much the, the Flames around the junior leagues. Yeah, and in the NCAA, uh, Kuzmanci is having seven points. It, that's about normal for a guy that's drafted in his rookie year to be low-ish on points. Like, I remember when Jankowski went there, a lot of people freaked out because he had a... I think he only had like 18 or 20 points in his first full season in the NCAA. I also don't and think that, is based on what we've seen, is going to be a huge goal scorer. He's one of those guys who might eventually turn out to be a decent player, but like I think that if he does, it'll be like in the same vein as like Jimmy Vesey. Yeah, I mean, I can see his game more progressing the Michael Backlund route, where he becomes a solid puck mover, but a really defensive center, you know, defensive forward. That's possible too. I don't think he'll be as good as uh, Backlund, but I think that same kind of mold of a player. Yeah, and by that same consideration, Matthias Pedersen has been absolutely dynamite. Being over a point per game in the NCAA is tough as to a do. freshman. Yeah, even period is tough to do, but as a freshman, it's practically unheard of. So that is another guy like Zavgrovny who's going to be someone to keep their your eyes on because of the fact that that is too good of skill for relative to where the Flames picked them. That, it, it, frankly, it, in the NCAA, if you have more than fifty points in a season and he's trending that way, like that's those are your top tier guys in the league. And to do that as a freshman is just ridiculous. And so we might have hit a home run with him as well. But again. We're in the end of November. It's at least <laughs> nice to see some depth there. Yeah. It, at least it's something encouraging to look at instead of like uh, M M Matson, who has zero points, and you're like, oh, okay, you're there. The only issue here is, I guess, Martin Pospisil, who's playing in the uh, NCAA. He's got, I guess, his, he's not eligible. I'm still trying to follow the whole story, but I guess he's not eligible to play. There's some visa issues or something, so he can't play in the NCAA all year. So it'll be interesting to see what the Flames do with him. If they turn him pro and send him to the AHL or the ECHL, but I don't think they're going to want a prospect like that sitting out the whole season. Yeah. So you we'll can't, see. You can't really – I mean, once you're in the NCAA, you can't drop back to a junior league generally. So – They'll either send them to Europe or set them out, or I could see them. There's not a lot of room right now on the forward lines in Stockton, but maybe you send them to Kansas City. They don't want to use a contract on them, but I'm sure that you know Kansas could sign them to an ECHL deal. Yeah, that's very feasible. The only issue there, I think, is that you lose your uh, college eligibility for the future then. Yeah. Well, Matt, with that, I think it's time for some special we have this week. We have an interview that we recorded with Flames Hall of Famer Peter Marr talking about his new book, If These Walls Could Talk, Calgary Flames, stories from the Calgary Flames Ice Locker Room and Press Box. So why don't we go to that interview, and we'll be back afterwards. Here we are for a special Fireside Chat interview. This is Dan and Matt, as always. And for the first time, we have a NHL Hall of Famer on the phone with us. This is a legendary Flames radio broadcaster, 34, or 30, 34 years with the Flames, 2,957 games called, the legendary Peter Marr. Peter, how are you doing tonight? Yeah, I'm doing well, thank you, guys. And... Uh, we brought you on, obviously, to talk about your new book that's come out, If These Walls Could Talk, the Calgary Flames stories from the ice, the locker room, and the press box. You put this out with George Johnson. Peter, was this something when you retired in 2014 that you knew you wanted to do a book, or did this come to you later? How did this come to be? No, I really had no desire to, to write a book when I uh, retired. My, uh, in fact, I had a couple of people 
uh, come to me and, and mention the possibility of uh, writing a book, and uh, I had no desire whatsoever. And then, um, oh, about two years ago, or a little better than two years ago, I guess it was, George Johnson uh, came to me and um, and asked me if I'd be interested in, in writing a book for uh, this company out of Chicago, a publisher out of Chicago, who publish uh, books on uh, you having uh, play-by-play broadcasters from the NHL, uh, National Basketball Association, NFL, and, and Major League Baseball. Um, they would get play-by-play guys with experience of many years um, writing books for them with, with uh, co-authors. So I kind of thought about it and figured, well, you know, with George, having been around for about 24 of the uh, of the 34 years that I broadcast Flames games, he'd have a pretty good idea of some of the things that I'd uh, want to have in a book. So uh, after a little bit of uh, consultation with him, we decided to go ahead and uh, write the book. So it's about two years in the making and finally came out uh, a month or so ago. And great, great item for Christmas for anyone who's looking to buy some for a Flames fan on their list. Well, that's uh, generally these books, uh, and not only this one, but a lot of other books right around the right around the world coming out with uh, the holiday season in mind with uh, the book time timing to uh, allow people to uh, get gifts for uh, for people in their families or friends or whatever. So hopefully uh, a lot of folks are going to enjoy uh, reading this book uh, now or over the holiday season. Peter, uh, now that uh, you've been retired since uh, 2014, uh, what does your day look like now? And do you still keep tabs on how the Flames are doing? Yeah, my days are a lot, uh, lot more um, time for myself than I had when I was uh, broadcasting. And it was interesting. Uh, the first year after a retirement, it was really an adjustment time for me. I, um, I talked to a number of people who had retired at various fields, including some in, in the broadcast field, before I retired to get some advice from them. And uh, they had a lot of advice. But the one consistent thing I heard from all of them was that uh, you're going to find time long in that first year. And uh, they were they were absolutely right. Um, in, in the winter time, in particular, uh, with the flame hockey season starting in September and going through until April, and some years longer than that, uh, it was pretty much a um, seven day a week situation for me. So uh, I didn't have a whole lot of time for anything else. So when I retired um, in the winter time, uh, I really struggled uh, trying to find things to do. My hobbies were golf and cycling, and of course you can't do that here in uh, Calgary uh, in the winter time. So when I was away in places like Phoenix and, and Palm Springs, obviously the the time would go a lot, a lot quicker. But it was quite an adjustment in the uh, beginning. Uh, now I'm uh, pretty much uh, adjusted to it. Although there are some days when uh, I find time going uh, long, uh, I'm still actively involved in some things. I uh, I do a uh, a uh, report on flames three days a week on uh, XL 103 in Calgary, uh, four or five minute hit at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, I'm also involved with the uh, with the flames. I uh, I uh, do uh, hosting at the what they call the uh, alumni dressing room experience uh, prior to each uh, flame game at the uh, Saddle Dome. When I'm in town, I'm hosting that with a uh, with a former flame players. We tell stories there for about a half an hour or so and entertain uh, the crowd who. Uh, eventually go out and, and, and watch the game. So I also do uh, a fair amount of charity work and also do some public speaking. So I'm keeping uh, relatively busy now, but uh, I'm also having time to uh, spend more of my family, which was something that uh, I didn't get that much of an opportunity to do when I was working. That's great that you're able to do that. Uh, you've called pretty much every single one of the Flames playoff runs, including all three of their runs to the Stanley Cup. I think that for fans of this podcast, the one that everybody remembers is the 2004 Stanley Cup run, maybe because it was such an unlikely run. But as someone who was part of that season, what do you think made that one so special? Oh, that was absolutely an incredible, uh, incredible year. That that uh, season didn't start off very well. Uh, the 03-04 season, uh, at the outset, the Flames had not made the playoffs in uh, – in seven straight years, weren't expected to make the playoffs that year either. And the way the year started, it didn't look like there was going to be any playoffs. Uh, I well recall the night uh, of uh, November the 16th, uh, the uh, Flames had had a game in, in Edmonton and lost the game, and with that loss fell into last place uh, in the Western uh, Conference. And flying home from that game, and when he arrived here in Calgary, Daryl Sutter, who was the general manager coach of the team, uh, said to me, just as we were arriving, 
um, be around tomorrow. I think I'm going to be making a trade. And uh, sure enough, the next morning around 10 o'clock, got the call that uh, the Flames had indeed made a deal with San Jose to acquire uh, Mika Kiprasov. And that uh, he came here immediately after not having played a game at all over the first month uh, and a half of that uh, season uh, as he was the number three goalie in San Jose. And he came here, and right away the fortunes of the Flames had changed. They went from being a last-place team to a team that went to the seventh game of the Stanley Cup final. And, uh, you know, there, there are a couple of things that made that year uh, so much more uh, dramatic, I think, than or, or fan involvement, I think, than... Uh, in the previous two runs to the Stanley Cup uh, final. For one thing, the city was twice as big in 2004 as it was in 86 and 89, the other two times the Flames went to the, uh, went to the Cup final. And the other thing was it was such a big underdog. Uh, an underdog seemed to capture the imagination of fans more than teams that are, uh, that are supposed to win or favored to win. And it just it, it engulfed the entire community as that uh, playoff run went along, and they, they scored those upset victories over Vancouver and Detroit and San Jose before taking on San Jose or Phoenix uh, Tampa rather in the Stanley Cup final. So it was uh, it was quite an exciting exciting time for, for Flame Hockey that uh, 2004 uh, run. You're a guy who was there. You've probably seen it a lot since then. What do you think, Peter? Game seven was it in? Uh, game six, um, the, well, I, uh, when it happened, I didn't know. Uh, when the, when the uh, play developed uh, in, the, um, in the Tampa zone right around the net, from my vantage point, you couldn't tell whether it was a goal or not. Uh, and I think the players on the ice, in fact, I know the players on the ice, didn't know it went in the net. The play went on for a little bit and then finally stopped. And uh, there was a 46-second uh, video review, review as that was the first year that they had video review in the uh, in the NHL, and they didn't have all the camera angles that they they have today. They didn't have the overhead uh, camera, so they didn't have the, uh, the the great facilities that they have now uh, to make a determination when they're doing a review of a goal. And um, unfortunately, they didn't have any angle that clearly showed it into the net. But it was interesting the next morning when you picked up the front page of the Calgary Sun and you saw the puck across the goal line, and uh, indeed it was a goal. So that was very disappointing. You know, there were about seven or eight minutes left to go in the third period of that game, and if the goal had counted, uh, you know, quite likely the Flames would have held on and won and and won the Stanley Cup. Instead, it went to double overtime, and uh, the uh, Lightning won on a goal by Martin Saint-Louis and then had to go back to Tampa for Game 7. That was an exciting game right to the end before uh, the Lightning pulled off the victory. So, yeah, it's unfortunate that that didn't happen. But I'm reminded by people in Vancouver uh, after that that in 89 they felt that uh, the winning goal in Game 7 of the opening round of the playoffs that year, the Flames against the Canucks, shouldn't have counted either when, uh, when, Joe, when Joe Lotto uh, had the puck go off his skate into the net in the, in the overtime period that was at the Scotiabank Saddle Dome. So uh, sometimes these things even out. Yeah. yeah, I guess in the end it's it all comes out in the wash, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would have been it would have been nice though to uh, have capped off that great great run in '04 with with the Stanley Cup victory. Peter, uh, Flames fans know your iconic yell at various times, "Yeah, baby." Where did that come from, and when did you know how special that phrase was for Flames fans? Well, um, you know, it, it's interesting how that developed. It actually developed in 1986 uh, when the Flames were involved in that second-round playoff series with uh, Edmonton. The Oilers were supposed to win that series rather easily. They had finished 39 points ahead of uh, the Flames uh, during the, uh, the regular season, but uh, the Flames, uh, coached by Bob Johnson, pulled off some upsets in the early going of the games in that series and um, had taken a 3-2 to two lead going into game six that was held here in uh, in calgary and um what had happened i was at the uh, the morning skate uh the day of that uh game six and uh, after conducting interviews and the other things they do at the, at the morning skate, i was driving home after that and was listening to some music on, on the radio they didn't have uh they didn't have talk radio in those days with sports uh, stations and news stations and that type of thing. So I was listening to some music, and one of the songs that was being played, I don't even know the name of the song or who was singing it, but in the refrain there was a, there was a huge roar of, yeah, baby. And that kind of stuck with me, and I said, well, if the Flames can uh, pull off an upset and win the game tonight, I'll, uh, I might use that. And as it turned out, Edmonton won that game, and so the series had to go back to Edmonton for a, for a seventh game. And um, and uh, that was the game, of course, that um, 
that Steve Smith inadvertently uh, shot the puck off the skate of his own goaltender um, and uh, uh, and allowed the game to get the game-winning goal, which was credited to Perry Bears and giving the Flames a 3-2 lead at that point in time. And there was still another eight or nine minutes left to go in that game. And I well remember with four seconds left, uh, the face-off in the uh, in the uh, flame zone, and uh, Mark Messier winning the face-off and, and getting the puck back to Yari Curry, who shot just missed the net. And it was at that point, just soon after that, that I yelled out, "Yeah, baby!" for the for the first time. And uh, I decided at that point that anything significant that um, was done by the Flames as a team or done by by an individual, I would uh, yell, the "Yeah, baby!" Uh, and at that, at those particular point in time, the Flames, of course, had a good run to the Stanley Cup final that year, so it used a bit. Uh, and then again, of course, there were some 50 goal scores and there were some four goal games and that type of thing where it got used a bit in the 80s and the early part of the 90s. But really, it, it, it didn't gain traction until that 04 run. Uh, there was a long stretch there where it was only Jerome McGinley who was getting the Yeah Baby yells for some of the scoring accomplishments he was attending with that Flame team that we talked about earlier. Uh, that wasn't uh, getting into the playoffs, and uh, but that 04 run, it really, uh, it really caught on here in the city. And I think the big reason for that was the the excitement that was being generated with the team winning. But more importantly, uh, you know, the day after the game with sports radio on, then uh, the re- the replay of that goal was uh, being played 20 times a day, or sometimes more than that. And it and it started to get a whole lot more excitement among the uh, among the fans in the city. And not only that but right around the NHL. The goal that Marty Jelena scored uh, in Game 6 against Detroit in overtime to clinch that uh, series, uh, the second-round uh, series, that goal was, uh, was one that got a lot of uh, universal attention. Uh, ESPN, the sports network uh, in the United States at the time, uh, that year each week had a top five highlights from the NHL playoffs and or the NBA playoffs uh, that were going on. And that goal that Marty scored... Uh, they used the the audio of it, but used used the video of it from the from the telecast. But used my uh, the audio from my radio broadcast of the of that game. And it's amazing how many phone calls I got from radio stations uh, throughout North America uh, talking about that. And I, I often tease Marty Jelena when I see him. I say, Marty, you put me in the Hockey Hall of Fame uh, with that goal because it just uh, it, it just resounded. Uh, right around North America, as I say, and a couple of years after that, I got inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. So I think that goal brought some attention to, uh, to me as well as uh, as the Flames and led to that. Oh, for sure. When we talk to fans still, they still remember that one phrase when we say Peter Marr's name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's become something that uh, is attached to me now. You know, when, I, when I'm involved in the activities that I was talking about earlier at the uh, Flame Games, uh, I'm often asked to, um, to sign autographs, and if I don't put Yeah Baby on there, they ask me to do that. So now it's, it's, it's automatic. I put Yeah Baby and then, uh, and then write my name uh, with the autograph uh, that I give to the fans that ask for them. So, yeah, it's become quite an attachment for me. There's no question about that. You're a New Brunswick boy. You started your, uh, your career in 1977 calling the Toronto Maple Leafs games, and then in 1980 you came to Calgary to be the first real play-by-play voice for the Flames on the radio. Can you tell us a little bit about that decision to leave Toronto and come to Calgary and what that meant to you? Well, it was a pretty easy decision to make. Uh, I had to broadcast the, the Maple Leaf games uh, for three years uh, on, a, on a station that had, um, had uh, purchased the broadcast rights for the Maple Leafs, uh, outbidding uh, a radio station in Toronto that was owned by Foster Hewitt at the time, the legendary uh, broadcaster who uh, had pretty much retired as a broadcaster at that point, although he did broadcast one game a year uh, when he had the broadcast rights for his radio station. And um, this upstart station came in and outbid him for the rights, and uh, I ended up uh, I ended up getting that job uh, just prior to the start of the regular season uh, of 77-78. Uh, uh, they had a three-year deal uh, for the uh, rights and signed me to a three-year contract. But at the end of those three years, they, they ran into some financial problems and ultimately uh, went out of business. They were an all-new station and were probably a little ahead of their time uh, for, for Canada. Uh, and um, so they did not rebid for the rights. The, the rights went back to the station owned by uh, Foster. And, of course, he had uh, his two sons that were there, so there was no position for me. But it worked out really well because... Um, 
some of the games that I broadcast uh, with the Maple Leafs were aired on radio stations here in, in Calgary because the Flames weren't here yet. And um, when the uh, Flames came, uh, Jiggs McDonald, who had been the play-by-play uh, broadcaster for the uh, Flames in Atlanta, he went to New York to broadcast for the New York Islanders. And uh, so there was an opening, and um, uh, I applied for it. And since I had a little bit of recognition out here uh, with the game, Leaf games uh, that were heard, uh, I ended up uh, getting that job, and that turned out to be the, the best move of my career. And it, it has worked out outstandingly to, to still be here and still uh, be involved with the, with the hockey scenes, with the uh, Flames, and, and their uh, endeavors at the Saddle Dome. Peter, uh, the new foreword of your book is written by Jerome Ginla. Can you tell us a story about Ginla that fans might not know? Um, well, there's, there's, they all know the stories about how many uh, great performances he put on uh, for the Flames. In, in a lot of those down years, he was the uh, he was the main attraction for the team, and of course, was very pivotal in that uh, playoff run in '04. But one story that uh, I don't think too many fans are familiar with, I think a lot of fans are familiar with the fact that, um, that he was very engaging with the fans, with that, with that infectious smile that he had. But uh, I well remember the night uh, that the Flames beat out San Jose uh, to win the, um, the Western Conference Championship in, in 2004. That was a game that was played at the, uh, at the Saddle Dome. And uh, at the end of the game, where I went down and did my normal dressing room interviews and, and then went in on the uh, post-game show with the rest of our broadcast crew. And it was about an hour and a half after the game. I'm going out into the uh, parking lot at the uh, Saddle Dome, and it was raining. And uh, there was Jerome in the middle of the parking lot on a night when, uh, when he certainly, uh, certainly uh, would have been forgiven to have been out celebrating with the rest of his teammates after the major accomplishment of winning that series. But here he was in the middle of the parking lot in the pouring rain, uh, signing autographs for some young kids uh, that were there. And not only was he signing autographs for them, he, he was taking time to also ask them how they were doing in school and, and things of, of that nature. So, um, you know, that was just another aspect of, uh, of Jerome. I'm sure he caught up with his teammates to celebrate the triumph, but he, he had time for the, those fans that were there. And uh, I also recall uh, often when the team was on the road, uh, leaving the, the hotel where they were staying at to go to the arena uh, for the game on the, uh, the particular night, uh, Jerome would always come out about 10 minutes early knowing there were autographed people that were around the front door of the hotel or around the bus that were looking for autographs. Now, some of them were professional autographs uh, people uh, who were uh, getting his autograph and, and selling them, but Jerome would always go to the, he'd always recognize who were the uh, non uh, business people out there, if you will, and would sign their autographs first. That he would always sign one autograph uh, card or picture uh, for the uh, for the uh, people that were out there uh, looking for his autograph to sell them. The business people. So he always had time. It was uh, you know pretty incredible uh, seeing all those things behind the scenes with Jerome and how he integrated with the fans so very very well. And it certainly was a was a tough time here in the city uh, when he uh, left after 16 uh, years. But it was nice he came back this summer and announced his retirement uh, as a member of the uh, of the Flames. So, um, and I'm very we we're very fortunate to have him uh, write the foreword for our uh, book. And when I approached him about it, uh, it was without hesitation that he agreed uh, to do it. And uh, you know, he started it off by uh, saying that in his he thought that I was the only guy to see him play every game he played as a member of the Flames over those 16 years. And and after I thought about it, after after reading it in the forward, uh, I think yeah, he, he probably very accurate because there were different coaches, different trainers, different players, and uh, different uh, uh, different uh, media people that were around. So I guess I'm probably was the only one to uh, see him play in all those games, and it certainly was a great thrill to follow him uh, throughout his great career here with the Flames. And unfortunately, uh, he didn't end up with a Stanley Cup. He won everything else that he uh, was involved in as a uh, as a player in the game. Peter, a lot of our fans here on Fireside Chat like to know a little bit about sort of the behind the scenes of the jobs the various NHL players or other people working in the league have. And one of the questions one of our fans sent us was, when calling games for the Flames, what did your day typically look like, and how is it different for home games versus road games? Um, well, the, my day typically started uh, when I would wake up in the morning, and often that would be around 6.30 or 7 o'clock. Uh, whether I was home or on the road, I always uh, I always had a radio show to do at eight o'clock. 
uh, on the uh, on the radio station, uh, the Fan 960 in Calgary. And so that's how it all, uh, I would get up um, and start preparing for that show, go on and do that for the 15 minutes or so that it went on. And uh, after that, I'd start uh, preparing for, for the game that night, uh, getting my uh, notes together and, and, and compiled. And then at uh, about 10 o'clock in the morning, we'd uh, be, at the, be at the Saddle Dome or at the arena on the road where the, where the Flames were playing to uh, be involved in the uh, morning skate to watch the, the players from both teams when they had their morning skates. And then afterwards, go into the respective dressing rooms and get interviews with players as well as picking up additional uh, notation information about the players and about the team uh, to uh, to compile on my notes that I would uh, then uh, get ready for the game. So after the morning shave was over, if I was home in Calgary, I'd come back to my home and uh, get that uh, prepared. And if I was on the road, obviously, we'd get back to the uh, the hotel that we were staying at and then uh, conclude my uh, preparation, getting my notes totally in order, having uh, uh, printing them out on the printer that I uh, took with me when it was on the road or the printer I had at home. And then I would get involved in my memory work of uh, memorizing the uh, numbers of the uh, players on the opposing team the Flames would be playing on uh, that uh, particular evening. And I would, not, uh, I would not put that down until I was was absolutely uh, certain that I knew the numbers inside out of the players on that team. And, and uh, then uh, I would kind of back off a little bit. I have everything ready and everything studied. And uh, I often would have a, have a workout uh, at the hotel gym we're staying at or I work out at home. And uh, then I have a little bit of a bite to eat. And then uh, it would be off to the game, getting to the building. Usually uh, if we're on the road, we usually get there with the team about two hours before the game. And if we were at home, I usually get there about an hour and a half before the game. And very, uh, very soon after I would get to the arena, be it at home or on the road, I'd head up to the broadcast location and uh, get my notes, um, get my notes out on the on the table where I'm going to be uh, broadcasting from, and have that all laid out and all prepared and all ready, so that when the uh, teams came on the ice for the warm up. Uh, I would be able to focus on what was happening at the warm-up for the team the Flames are going up against. I do a mental play-by-play, or a uh, player identification, I should say, in my head of uh, watching the players. But I'd also be looking for other ways to identify the players other than uh, other than the numbers, because sometimes at the distances we were at, uh, you wouldn't get to see the numbers. So you'd you know you'd make uh, kind of little notes about how uh, the type of helmet they had or how they were wearing their sweater and their uh, pants and all that, that type of deal. Just little things that would allow you to uh, identify a player. Now, I, I don't didn't really need to memorize the Flame players because I've seen them so often that I could recognize them just by the way they uh, skate and their mannerisms uh, out on the ice. So uh, so we do the game, and then the game was over and get involved in interviews at the dressing room and then involved in the uh, post-game show. So it was a pretty long day on game days, but certainly I, I never um, I never um, uh, thought of once of that as being basically work. It was always a, a love of mine to be broadcasting and to be always prepared, regardless of how much time it took on a given game. If you hadn't become a broadcaster, what do you think you would have done as a career? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> no. Uh, I, uh, broadcasting, I started broadcasting... Uh, on the radio when I was 14 years old. So uh, basically, uh, broadcasting is pretty much all I've known. Um, uh, I was very fortunate growing up in a, in a town in New Brunswick, Campbell, New Brunswick, which had a population of about 7,000 people, uh, but it had a radio station there, and it, as it turned out, uh, I got my first um, uh, first opportunity to get in front of a microphone uh, with, with a local softball league that they had that was pretty uh, popular in the uh, community. And uh, I was doing the uh, public address announcing there for some of the games. And at one point, the radio station manager came to me and uh, asked me if I would uh, mind doing voice reports on each of the games for the radio station. So after the games were over, I'd go to the radio station or I'd phone the radio station to leave a voice or uh, from the game on that particular night. And then when I was in my last year of high school, I um, moved up and I was a sportscaster on the radio station. I'd go in, do the morning run till about 8.30, then go to school, and then come back again around 3.30, quarter to 4, and do the afternoon run. So um, that's, uh, that's how it started with me with regard to broadcasting. I also did quite a bit of writing at that time for the uh, local newspaper and also for, um, for the provincial newspapers there. And uh, eventually I would uh, uh, move on and get to do play-by-play of the uh, senior intermediate hockey team in my hometown, as well as one that was 
15 miles away that was in the same league. So I wound up getting a lot of uh, a lot of play-by-play experience, and I, I firmly believe that I had not had that experience uh, back in my my hometown. I wouldn't be. Uh, uh, here today talking about the uh, career that I had in the, in the uh, National Hockey League. So I always tell aspiring uh, play-by-play broadcasters that the most important thing for them to do uh, as they start out is to get as much practice as they can uh, broadcasting, uh, broadcasting games, be it just into a, a recorder. Uh, you know, go to a go to a Hitman game, sit in an area of the of the uh, building where there's not many people around, and just uh, talk into a uh, talk into a recorder, or go to a Alberta Junior Hockey League game, or that sort of thing. So, the more you do, the more you learn how to do uh, play by play and learn how to edit the game and what's important and what uh, not to. I remember not so long ago listening to one of my uh, broadcasts from my time way back in uh, in New Brunswick, and I listened to it and I said, "My wow, uh, I've come a long way from those." I wasn't quite. Uh, pleased with with what I was hearing from that, but those were some of my early years. And as I say, the more you broadcast, uh, the more experience you get in doing it, and um, know what's important and what's not important when you're calling a game. Sounds like Austin, we go back and listen to season one, doesn't it, Matt? Oh yeah, <laughs> a lot of bad episodes. <laughs> Um, so for, for fans that don't know, this book is really about Peter telling stories, all the stories from his time as a, as a member of, I guess, the not really the plane team, but you were on the road with these guys, you were in the planes with them, you were in the hotels. We don't want to probably, you probably don't want to spoil a whole uh, story, but is there sort of a teaser of one of the stories from the book that you can give us so that fans have an idea of what they might read if they get this book, Peter? Uh, well, there's a, there's a lot of book, uh, a lot of stories in there from behind the scenes. It's kind of a hodgepodge of, uh, of my time as a broadcaster. We talk about some of the activities that happened uh, during games, some of the more significant events there, but I also talk about a lot of things that happened uh, behind the scenes and uh, some, some fun stories that I had with players, with coaches, uh, members of management, and, and uh, that uh, type of thing. Um, I don't know, uh, probably one, one little story that, um, that uh, fans... Uh, may not be overly uh, familiar with, though, is that I actually was injured during uh, one of the games that I was uh, broadcasting. That was a game that was in the Scotiabank uh, saddled home, and to this day I don't know how it happened uh, because it was. I always broadcast from the same location in the saddled home after the uh, Flames went there in 1983. Uh, but one night in the early uh, in the early part of the 90s, I actually stood up and hit my head on one of the beams that was uh, just above my uh, broadcast uh, location. And uh, my head started to bleed, and at the same time the game was uh, was going on. And as this blood was uh, starting to trickle down my face, and, and some of it fall on my notes that I had prepared, I continued to do the uh, the play-by-play of, of the game while some of the people that were around our producer was rushing to try and find some paper towels so he could uh, place it on my head to stop the the bleeding or at least the blood from flowing as it, as it was. And uh, eventually we got that stopped, and but I never stopped broadcasting uh, the game. And uh, it was really interesting is that, that at the end of the uh, that period and uh, just prior to the start of the next period, uh, Al Coates, who was the general manager of the Flames at that particular time, he came up, he had a helmet from the dressing room. He, gave, he said, uh, you better wear that for the rest of this game to protect yourself. So uh, to this day, I don't know how it happened, but I do know that uh, it spilled quite a, a bit of blood from me. And... Uh, and um, and uh, despite thousands of so games that I broadcast from that same location, it never happened again. So I only needed that helmet for one period. Which is good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if I hit that too many times, I might not be around today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, were there any Flames that had uh, some secret talents that fans might not know about? Secret talents? Oh, wow. Um, well, the, some of them are good pranksters. I remember a time in uh, I was sitting in the hotel lobby in Chicago and um, uh, I was reading a, a newspaper and had it wide open. I was reading it and Doug Gilmore stepped up and put it on fire with a lighter and uh, <laughs> and that kind of scared the heck out of me. Uh, fortunately, he and a few of the other guys were around to make sure they put the fire out before it burned down the hotel. Uh, so that you know there were those kind of things and there were the guys like in the, especially in the 80s. It seemed to be more so than the uh, than the other years or other decades of, of my career. There seemed to be a lot more practical jokes being played by uh, players 
uh, among themselves, among people that were part of their uh, their broadcast uh, or broadcast or traveling crew that were with the team uh, than we than we would have in, in in later times. Or maybe it was just that I was almost the same age as some of those guys at that time and uh, got involved in, in you know, those kind of fun activities with them. But uh, guys like Gilmore and uh, and uh, Jim Poplinski and, and Joey Mullen and um, Reggie Lemelin and and uh, a few other guys. They were pretty good. Uh, they were pretty good at uh, being pranksters. And also, I should note that uh, Kent Nilsson, of course, was a big star with the Flames in the uh, team's early years here in Calgary back in the 80s. Uh, he he uh, became pretty adept at sharpening his own skates um, before games to get himself uh, ready for them. So uh, when he first started out of that, I understand he wasn't very good, but he was really really good at it uh, by the time that um, he gained a little bit more experience with it. So little things like that. Before we wrap up today, Peter, uh, you still follow this team. What are your thoughts on the 2018-2019 edition of the Calgary Flames so far? Well, I'm not going to make any predictions because last year uh, at one of the functions I was involved in with the uh, Flames, I made the prediction that I thought last year the Flames and the Oilers would finish in the top two positions in the uh, Pacific Division, and I think I jinxed them because uh, I also made comments at the time that I didn't think Vegas was going to be very good or the California teams were kind of on the decline. And as it turned out, Vegas went to the Stanley Cup final, and the California teams all made the playoffs, and, of course, the Flames and the Oilers didn't. So I'm not going to make any predictions, but I've uh, been very impressed with, uh, with this team over the, um, over the uh, first quarter uh, of the season. They didn't get off to a great start. They weren't getting great goaltending from uh, Smith other than a, than a couple of games. Uh, but uh, other aspects of the team's games definitely uh, are coming around. Uh, toward the latter part, or the second half of the first quarter, uh, they were allowing less than 30 shots on goal per game. They're out shooting the opposition. They're playing a, a fast-paced game in the face of the uh, in the face of the opponents. They're a very, very uh, quick team. And I, I look at the defense. I think that's a bit more uh, solid blue line than they had last year. There's a lot more depth among the uh, forwards. And having said that, James Neal still hasn't come on. Uh, and, and uh, put up the scoring numbers that he has in the past, but I'm confident that he'll change that. I think the big question is the goaltending position. I think if they can get some good goaltending, be it from Smith or Riddick uh, or a combination of both or somewhere else, then I think they've got a very good chance to uh, to be the number one team in the Pacific Division uh, during the regular season. And, of course, with that, it would give them home ice advantage in the first round of playoffs. And last year it was Vegas who finished first in the division, and they parlayed that into a trip to the Stanley Cup final. So uh, they're going to have some competition, no question, in, in the uh, Pacific Division. Uh, I think primarily from, uh, from uh, San Jose. But uh, I really like the makeup of this Flame team and the way they're playing, uh, the way that uh, Bill Peters, the coach, uh, has uh, directed them to play with a different uh, style. And I think going to China was not a benefit for them. Uh, going to China may have helped uh, spread goodwill and also uh, – help the prospects of having uh, hockey grow into that country and also probably helped a bit with the players' camaraderie. But I don't think it did any good for the team's on-ice uh, performance considering uh, the fact that uh, they had a new coach and they had about eight new players with a new system. Uh, they didn't get much time to practice when they were over in China there for that week and a half or so. So I think they're a little bit slow catching up, but they certainly have picked it up over the last while, and uh, I certainly like what I've seen. One thing we've said on the show for a while, and curious if you would agree would you say this is probably the most complete flames lineup we've seen in as long as you can remember uh, yeah well i just looking at the scoring uh looking at the scoring of the uh flames going into the game they had last night i haven't looked at it today but i'm probably pretty close to being the same they had three players uh with 21 points in in 20 games uh that being uh lindholm monahan and kachuk and then uh johnny goudreau had 20 points in 20 games and uh, that's all improved since that uh, seven goals they had in the uh, game the other night. Uh, but I've never seen them have uh, that many uh, scorers with those high numbers uh, at the top of the scoring rates. If you look at uh, going back on past years with this team, there's always this one guy or maybe two guys that were up there at the top, and then there's a huge, huge gap in points collected by uh, players below that. But this year, uh, you know, they've got those four guys up there, and, and uh, Giordano's not far behind either, and a couple of other forwards aren't far behind. So I, I really like how they, uh, you know, they have a much more balanced scoring attack than they've had in a long while. We've joked on the show a few times. If you remember when Jerome was here, the perpetual question is, can they find a center for Jerome? And we've said, hey, they finally found a center and left winger for Jerome. 
<laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that was a perpetual question. You're absolutely right. And, um, you know, I had various guys that come in and, and work with him uh, and had some success uh, as his centerman for short periods of time. But it was pretty amazing when you think back on it that um, that he never really had a, a regular centerman for a long period of time, yet here he was uh, scoring all those goals and, and getting so many points and, and carrying the team offensively on his shoulders. For sure. Well, thanks for your time tonight, Peter. We just want to remind fans that if they want a copy of your book and they want to meet you, maybe say hi, that on December 1st uh, at 11 a.m., you're going to be the Adrenaline Source for Sports, which is uh, 9309 McLeod Trail South, and you'll be signing copies of the book. So if you want to say hi to Peter, make sure you go out. Great time to get your book signed. Great time to get a book signed for the Flames fan on your Christmas list. And I'm sure Peter would be more than happy to uh, shake your hand and say hi. Yeah, definitely would be pleased to do that and sign the book for them uh, personally uh, as well. So look forward to having uh, a good turnout there at Adrenaline on December the uh, 1st. And, of course, the book's available at all bookstores in the area or online at Amazon.com. So, Dan and Matt, thank you very much for uh, allowing me some time to uh, talk about the Flames and talk about the book. It was an honor to have you on. Thanks, Peter. We really appreciate it. Pleasure. Matt, it was a lot of fun to get to talk to Peter Marr, wasn't it? Oh, that was one of the highlights. I, I think that may be the highlight since we've been doing this. He's a fun guy. He's got lots of cool stories, and he's got a book out, which, as we talked about, has a lot of these stories in it. So if you're looking for a gift for yourself for Christmas or another Flames fan in your list, or you just want to suggest your loved ones buy it for you, it's If These Walls Could Talk, Calgary Flames, stories from the Calgary Flames Ice, Locker Room, and Press Box. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it in any bookstore. Um, we mentioned during that interview an upcoming autograph signing with Peter on December 1st, but there's probably going to be some more as we get close to the Christmas. So grab the book. I've read it already. It's a really fun book and not a bad price. Right now on Amazon, it's uh, 23 bucks or nine ninety nine for the Kindle edition. You can't beat that. Definitely not. And you know what that means, Matt? It's time to look ahead to the next week of Flames action. So who are we going to blow out this week? Well, let's talk about how we did last week first. Neither of us got things right. We predicted the right number of points. We both knew there'd be two wins, but we got the wrong wins. So I thought we'd beat Vegas and Arizona and lose to Winnipeg. You thought we'd beat Winnipeg and Vegas and lose to Arizona. And we ended up beating Winnipeg and Arizona and losing to Vegas. Um, So this week, there's three games, two at home. Dallas will be here. L.A. will be here. And then we go to Chicago on Sunday. That's a 5 p.m. start time, so set your calendar accordingly. First off, Matt, let me ask you this. Do you think that Smith starts any of these games? I would possibly give him the Kings game. So you go back to Riddick for Dallas? Yeah. I I think that you have to... Uh, Smith played well against Arizona, and he looked, frankly, more like the Smith that we've been used to earlier, like last season and that he's looked a lot better at times and you have to give him a shot it, you know because if he works it, things out like and he can play well like he used to be able to then you basically solve the goaltending problem that we've had if he doesn't then but you also can't he, rush back to him back like, wow one good game give the man the starting net again no, exactly, and I think that you give Riddick a shot in the Dallas game, and if you're going to see Smith back this week, it'll be against the Kings just because the Kings, frankly, are terrible. Do you then and put the better goalie of the two against Chicago? I'd go back to Riddick I would either too. way. Yeah. So, Matt, why don't you start off here? What do you think for the week? I'm going to be bold six points. You think we win them all? Yeah. I, I frankly, I think Dallas is not like if we're going to lose one, I think it'll be Dallas. Uh, Chicago doesn't have nearly as much depth, although they did get two Coyotes guys from the other day. If Brandon Perlini's what stops us, we're, we're in trouble. Like, I, I'm just not overly impressed with Chicago. Like, the, they still have Kane and Taze playing well, but frankly, they're beatable. And L.A. is terrible, so they really should get two points there. And 
Dallas, it, it will be more of a coin toss, and I think that the Flames can take them too. The Flames have had some really good games against Dallas the last couple of years. I can remember a couple recently where I'm like, you know what? Those were really fun hockey games to watch as a fan, and they've gone both ways. But I agree with you. I think the wild card this week is Dallas. I'm going to be bold. I'm going to say the Flames uh, win in LA and Chicago, lose to Dallas. I guess maybe not bold, but I'm going with the obvious choice, I guess. Yeah. Not as bold as uh, you. It, yeah. It, if Bishop plays, the Dallas game will hinge on if Bishop plays well. If he does, we're going to lose that game. If he doesn't, we'll win. Because, uh, frankly, I think both teams offensively are fairly evenly matched. And it will just come down to a battle of goaltending. And if Bishop's on his game, he's very tough to beat. Yeah, I look at Dallas and Calgary, and I think they're, like you said, there's a lot of analogs between the two teams. And I think if you can beat Dallas, you've almost beaten your mirror image in a lot of ways. Yeah, like I think Calgary's overall is a deeper team and more talented. One through 12 up front and one through six on the blue line. But there's a lot of parallels between the two teams. And I think Calgary has better defense and Dallas probably has slightly better offense. I'll d argue with you there, but it's close either way. They definitely have the better goalie Dallas does. Not necessarily. You don't think so? Bishop, when he's playing well, I think is one of the best in the league still. Yeah. And Riddick or Smith, if they're playing well, they are they can match it. So. Well, we'll see. It, That'll be yeah, a fun one that, to watch. Yeah. It, it's an interesting game because you've got two teams that can give the other team a black eye. So... You know, it's not where one team should win. Like, say the Calgary-LA game, Calgary should win that game. Well, and, but, I think, and I think the key there, too, is for Calgary not to go in too cocky. I mean, LA still has some offensive weapons. They have they don't have much in net, but I think if the Flames go in too cocky, LA could surprise them. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And you can't take anybody for granted because, you know, even a guy like Cal Peterson can throw a shutout at you and... Even Edmonton wins yeah. from time to time. Exactly. So, yeah, I think it, that game, though, if you're looking for the game, I know I've talked to a lot of Calgary fans this year who are like, tell me what games to watch to feel good about my team. That's the one for this week. That L.A. game is the one where the Flames have the opportunity to embarrass another team. Yeah, like that could easily be a, like a game from this week where like the Winnipeg or the Ve first Vegas game or the Arizona game where... You know, Calgary could get five, six, seven plus goals. And yeah, it could be a not so good night for the stat sheet for the opposition. Yeah, we'll see who else can get on the score sheet that hasn't yet. Everybody should just start feeding James Neal the puck until he puts one in. <laughs> well, you know, if you can run up the score enough, you might be able to. Yeah, well, I think that frankly, the, the Flames should at some point just try Neil on the first line for like even if a period or two just to switch things up like say move Backlund down to the third line move Lindholm down with Kachuk and Bennett and throw Neil up there just for a period just to try and invigorate the team well I think when you can get yourself up you know five goals in the first period you open up more possibility to do that mm -hmm. you know get yourself up and then try some different things well, Matt, let's hope your predictions are right and the Flames end up getting six points out of the week. I think that'll be a big week for them and a big week for Flames fans. Thank you for listening, everybody. Have an excellent week, and as always, go Flames go. We'll talk to you next week. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.